damaged products because of the damage in transportation is like a seven billion dollar problem in North America every year. And so, you know, the customers want to get their products that aren't damaged, of course. When we try to improve product stability, uh, we try to maximize case packing, we try to maximize and stabilize palletizing and then contain the load better through uh, optimal use of stretch film. One of the big post-pandemic problems that we see the industry and the food processors and manufacturers facing is, of course, the shortage of labor. So hi there, food enthusiast. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Future Food Guest, where thought leaders in the, today's food industry discuss the trends and technology that will shape the future of the food. Uh, today, we are speaking with Derek Jones and Rodney, Rodney Grounds. Um, from Rovabag, USA. Um, I believe they are based out of uh, Duluth, Georgia. Uh, Rodney and Derek, how are you guys doing today? Well, we're doing well. Thank you for the opportunity to join your podcast today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Today. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so, so Rodney and Derek, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, would you mind sharing with our guest, you know, about Rovabag, USA, you know, your product technologies, what you do, and any information or on the context you think you might be relevant to our listeners? Sure, sure. I think maybe we should start with just a brief introduction. My name is, of course, Rodney Grounds, and I'm the Vice President of Sales at Robopack USA. I'm joined with Derek Jones, who's our Marketing Director for Robopack USA. A bit about Robopack. Robopack is a global company. Our headquarters are in Bologna, Italy. Uh, we have nine factories where we manufacture different types of packaging technologies. Uh, we manufacture uh, depalletizers, we pack, manufacture case packers, palletizers, stretch wrappers, and then laser guided vehicles or autonomous forklifts. Uh, each one of these is, is manufactured in a dedicated factory. We have factories around the globe, six, six in, in Italy, one in China, one in Brazil, and one out in Portland, Oregon. So true global company. We deal with uh, over 120 countries around the world, which gives us a bit of a, a unique perspective when it comes to food and beverage markets. We see trends that uh, may be very popular in Europe right now that haven't taken hold in the U.S. and vice versa. So uh, that's a bit about us and, and what we do. I will add to that, this is Derek. Uh, one of the things people do find unique about us, even though we are a global company, our North American headquarters are here in Duluth, Georgia, and we typically keep um, 250 plus machines in stock at any given time. So that allows our uh, companies like food and beverage manufacturing companies, distribution centers to uh, quickly get uh, a solution if they decide to use our organization for secondary packaging. So Derek and Rodney, I, I imagine your role, you know, as, as marketing and, and the VP, vice president of the company, you, you follow news about the food and the packaging industry, you know, you know, some of the techs, technology and the trends that's going on. What, which trend is of the most interest to you and, you know, for, for your organization, why? That's, that's a great, that's a great question. There's a, one trend that seems to be above all others, and that is uh, the trend for companies wanting to be more sustainable. Uh, and a lot of times in the food and beverage industries, what we're seeing is that companies want to reduce the amount of plastic that goes into a product. Uh, you already see manufacturers reducing uh, the, the thickness of plastic containers. Uh, you see a lot of that thing, those kind of things out there. We've kind of taken it one step further um, we, we have a research and development department that uh, we, we fund that with about 3% of our annual revenues. And we, as a result, we have over 120 global patents. One of the areas we've worked on is more technology or up-to-date technology in the stretch wrapping equipment sector. Uh, stretch wrappers are uh, a vital part of any food manufacturer's uh, line. It basically wants the, all the... Uh, the manufacturing processes have taken place and the packaging into a shipping container, it makes sure that that, that load of goods is gonna to get to the final destination in good order. Uh, it's very important to wrap and protect these things. In the past, uh, the solution has, has been, hey, if you need more protection, use more plastic, wrap more. Uh, our company has 
uh, developed a patented uh, a technology where we are able to do two things. We're able to do what's called varying the pre-stretch, multi-level variable pre-stretch of the film. So we're actually stretching the film out before it goes onto the palette and really reaching the limit of the film uh, stretchability. And the other thing that we can do is we can, in multiple layers of the palette, we can change the containment force. So now, instead of just throwing more film in a palette, we can scientifically come up with a wrap pattern to use the very least amount of film possible and get the best containment. Uh, we have seen, we have a technology lab here in our uh, facility in Duluth, Georgia, and we regularly test uh, these these loads, palletized and stretch wrap loads for for the major food and beverage 500, food and beverage 100 type companies. And we've seen reductions in stretch film usage uh, as high as 50%, but still the same containment. So if we can take 50% of the stretch film out of that waste stream, it's a huge win for sustainability on these companies. We recently, along with uh, you know, a kind of an init initiative that Derek, our marketing manager, has created, is we we do for our customers what we call sustainability summits, where we encourage these customers to bring in their palletized loads, allow our experts to come up with new scientifically designed wrapping patterns, and we bring in their the company's uh, sustainability officers, their engineering departments, and we do literally pallet wrapping and testing hands-on and come up with a solution for customers to remove plastic from the waste stream ultimately is our goal. And you know the thing about that and what's so important to these customers that go through that process is we're able to provide them with a report, not only saying, hey, we can reduce the amount of plastic that goes onto a pallet by 50%, but we can kind of dive down into what that really means as a sustainability effort. How many fewer cardboard cores are you going to use? How many fewer trucks are going to be delivering film to your facility? Uh, how much less landfill space is going to be required? How much less energy is going to be required because you're not as producing as much plastic? And we can put all those things in and give a customer an idea of the true sustainability that they're achieving from something just as simple as using less stretch film on the pallet. So that's one of the things that we see and one of the things that we are really pushing to provide good solutions. That's really interesting. Uh, you know, most of our discussions with the, with the food industry leaders so far also has been on the packaging, the food packaging, and many of them are complaining and are sort of, you know, finding a ch challenging to move on from the traditional way of packaging to, you know, a more, more like environment friendly, you know, uh, packaging, which is more biodegradable and stuff like that, right? right. On starch based packaging. In your uh, field, in your packaging industry, do you think uh, in the future, is there something like, you know, something like this lies ahead that, you know, you will be just moving away from the, from the film packaging and then maybe do some other different form of packaging? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point that you bring up. And so there are a lot of, there's a lot of effort put into biodegradable films and we're seeing some really big advancements in what I would call primary packaging films, films that are, are packaging pastries or something, for instance. We're not seeing as much success in the stretch film area for wrapping pallets with biodegradable, although there's several companies that are pushing and working on that. And I think we'll see that in the near future. Uh, but one, thing I would tell you is we've also, we, I, I mentioned this technology lab we have, we've, we've also partnered with some companies that are trying to come up with solutions where they're, instead of using as much stretch wrap, they're actually applying a little bit of glue in between layers of the palletization to keep the pallet stabilized with this, uh, with a glue that's a, a quick lock or an easy lock where when you try to take the pallet off, it easily uh, comes apart. So it allows you to use the stretch film instead of just being containment, now it's basically just a dust cover. The containment is held by this gluing. So we, we've had probably in the neighborhood of a dozen trials with this one particular company coming up with formulations of this glue that work. And so we put it through the test. Uh, in, our, in our tech lab, we have vibratory uh, shaker tables to simulate over the road transportation. We have uh, acceleration sleds that, ex, uh, you know, that mimic like a, a quick stop or a quick acceleration, those kind of things. So the, 
the culmination of our, our stretch wrapping technology and these tools we have in our tech lab and partnering with innovative companies, you know, I think we'll see more and more push to, toward reducing plastic even more to your point. That's great. So I think that, that really brings us to what are, what are the current, one of some of the biggest challenges you're facing today? Uh, you know, I'm sure the pre pandemic challenges would have been different and the post pandemic challenges have been different. Uh, you just want to build up on that, you know, some of the, the current challenges in your industry, I mean, specifically in RoboPack, I must say. Yeah. So, so what we see, and it's not only, you know, we've talked a lot about stretch wrapping, uh, but in all the segments of our business, whether it's case packing, whether it's palletizing, stretch wrapping, the laser guided vehicles, one of the big post pandemic problems that we see the industry and the food processors and manufacturers facing is, of course, the shortage of labor. Uh, you know, I, I talk to, you know, in, in the neighborhood of, of three to five people a day that they're complaining about not being able to find labor. So we're getting asked more and more to send our applications out to do site visits, to study areas where they can automate processes that they're currently manual. And so we are seeing a lot of interest in palletization, uh, automatic palletization, as opposed to manual palletization. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of people that are, are going away from a, a hand packing, packing model where you're you're opening it up an RSC case and forming it and hand packing and then sealing it to a, a true automated throughput, uh, automatic case packing procedure. So I would say the lack of labor that's available right now is fueling the need for automation at a, a higher pace than we've seen in quite some time. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the biggest gains we've seen in the, in the last couple of years, and quite frankly, our business has been very brisk, is in fully automated systems and solutions. People aren't just kind of piecing together small portions. They want they want the full automated solution because of this labor shortage. Yeah, that's an interesting point uh, because I'm sure in all these conversations that we had this far, I mean, labor shortage is something that's that's keep coming. It's pretty it's pretty uniform across the board. So, and you know that that really brings us to uh, you know for me to ask another question, which is. Certainly, you already pointed out innovation and you know new technologies is something I think the way to go at, at this point. Are are you working on any 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 technology that you believe is is something is something they want to bring up? You know, you want our viewers to know anything. It could be like emerging technologies or any enterprise technology or any technology that you that you believe is really helping or it will help potentially your business outgrow. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and it, and it is something that we we have focused. We, we focus primarily in the area of Industry 4.0. You know, that's a that's a big word out there in the industry night right now. The you know the Internet of Things, and so we have developed a platform that we call R Connect, and R Connect is uh, our trade name for our offering of Industry 4.0. So it basically provides a remote monitoring solution a remote diagnostic solution, uh, a, a, an ability to capture a lot of machine data that before wasn't available. And the unique thing about our approach is some of this information has been able to be gathered for many years, but it requires getting into a customer's network and customers typically don't like that. The IT department doesn't like that. So the technology we've developed is a cellular based technology. We'll put a cellular modem on our equipment, which sends up packets of information to the cloud. As a result, our end users, our customers can, from their iPhone or iPad or mobile device, they can pull up uh, a R-Connect app and locate an exact machine. And from that machine, they can tell things like, uh, you know, the mean time between failure, the machine's availability. Uh, they, that way they can judge and see if the machine's being used effectively. They can pull things like, uh, on, the, on the case of a stretch wrapper, uh, how many loads per hour are we wrapping? How much stretch film quantity and gram weight is going on each load? Uh, the technology allows us to, to set uh, some parameters that if uh, the machine, if falls outside of those parameters, it sends a text message to the customer to let them know that there's something wrong. It also does some predictive maintenance as, as well. Uh, you can load in uh, maintenance schedules and tie that into the equipment. And based on uh, our experience of hours of operation, it can give your maintenance department uh, 
preventative text message, hey, it's time to do this onto a machine. So I think that technology of being actually able to, to monitor these machines remotely, not just on the plant floor, but at the management level, it helps us do mainly the, the, the main thing we like to say is we have the, the resources here to do a lot of testing and set the standards for your package, whether it's uh, the, the case packing portion, the palletizing or the stretch wrap, and we can set that standard. And now with this ability of Arconnect to do the monitor, uh, monitor remotely, we can make sure those standards are, uh, are, are honored that they don't go off track. And the management of the company that's agreed to these standards we've set has peace of mind that they're gonna be followed on the plant floor and someone can't go out and make modifications for, for no particular region. So I would say that, you know, this jump into the industry 4.0 through our Arconnect platform is something very exciting for our customers. And just to add to that, um, one of the things people like on our, we sell a lot through distribution our dealer network. And one of the things that they do is they is sell consumables. So they would like, and it really helps them with Arconet understanding, you know, what the film usage is for these organizations. So they can get, they can actually be added through Arconet to, to be um, to be able to monitor or at least be prompted when, you know, they're, they're running low on film or it's time to um, ship more film. So that can all kind of be tied into it as well. Great point. Uh, one of the one of the things that keeps coming, you know, while we talk to some of the industry leaders is transparency in supply chain. I know it may not be that much of an interest in your industry, specifically the packaging per se. Uh, but one thing we are seeing is that the consumers are more interested in seeing the whole life journey, the the, the product life cycle, you know, the, the product journey, specifically from the growers. Or the farmer, to uh, you know, to the, the 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 supply chain logistics, you know, the third party logistics, fourth party logistics, and retailers, and then to the consumer. So they they're more interested in seeing the journey just by just maybe like a QR code, just scan it and see, okay, when was this package and things like that. So what what does that mean in your industry? Uh, do you see that that thing is of much significance? So, so you're right. The, you know, the, we're we're more on providing automation and equipment, so we don't see this much. But what I will tell you is that, uh, as I mentioned before, we we uh, quite frequently are doing business with some of the largest multinational companies in the world. I've noticed a trend over the last five uh, to seven years that in these companies' terms and condition packets that we must review before we enter into a big project, there is more and more about this transparency. Uh, about us agreeing to, you know, uh, share our employment practices, uh, penalties for using, you know, questionable labor sources, those kind of things. So I think that all falls back to this transparency that their final customers are demanding that they want to buy a product that's uh, produced fairly, uh, with, uh, you know, and safely, and those kind of things. On a on a on a pure standpoint of of how it affects our equipment, like. We're, we're, we're being asked more and more to provide systems that are tracking data through the system. Uh, to your point of you know, scanning a QR code and say, seeing where things have done. So tracking and traceability is, is big in the industry. And uh, we're asking to provide more solutions with collecting data, making that data available to a, a, a print and apply label type machine. Uh, so those aren't pieces of equipment that we manufacture, but they are pieces of equipment that we routine, re, routinely integrate into our systems. And it's for that exact reason. The, the products need to be labeled, the data needs to be tracked, where you have that traceability. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, anything, uh, Rodney and Derek, you wanna build up on the CSR activities that you're involved in, you know, maybe it's the carbon offset program. That's one of the other thing we keep uh, listening about the you know how some of the organizations are really thinking about it uh, you know about the carbon offset programs and how they believe that they need to be contributing much about it and sort of uh, you know seeing as to how what, what is their contribution you know just to offset the carbon you know from the environment and so anything right. 
Yeah, I think that goes back to, to Derek's uh, idea that we, we started about a year ago with these sustainability summits. Right. Uh, you know, I've been in the packaging industry for 25 years. And over the last 10 years, there's been a new level of management in most of these food and beverage companies, which are sustainability officers. And so, of course, they're, they're tasked with exactly what you ask about, you know, reducing carbon footprint. And so they're looking for all kinds of gains. Some things that we may have not seen as significant in the past are very significant to them. So if they can reduce 25% of the plastic they put on a pallet to contain their shipment, that's a big gain for them, especially if we, as Derek's been able to do, can, it can trace that down from the reduction in plastic and what does it mean to the carbon footprint, which are reports that we can provide uh, our customers. So it, it's, a, it's a big part of the game now. Uh, we, we have, I think, been keenly aware of it for about the last uh, couple of years that it's something that our customers want to see. Uh, typically, that's something that instead of coming in at the tail end of the conversation with the customer, it's usually one of the front end pieces uh, where, you know, if you, if you told me five years ago, it would be like an afterthought. Now it's on the forefront with our customers who are, again, our, our food manufacturers and producers, they're, they're concerned about their, their task with reducing that carbon footprint. And we have to respond by providing equipment that allows them to do that. That's great. Um, so, you know, we have talked a little bit about, you know, your work in, in the packaging industry, which is like more than 25 years. Now, now let's put your consumer hat on. And, and, and as a food consumer, what, what is important to you when it comes to the, you know, the food you eat? So I think food safety is number one, right? You, you want to make sure you're, you're, you're buying food that is, is safe to, to consume. And I can tell you that over the years I've been in the business, the, the, the level that companies go to to provide that food safety is at an all-time high. Uh, these food factories that we go to are very safe places. Uh, you know, a, a, a lot of that is uh, there's now more and better ways to track and trace. So if you do have an issue, you can you can uh, identify it very quickly. But I think food safety is probably the number one concern uh, of mine. Uh, Derek, from a marketing uh, perspective, may like a, <laughs> a, a nice marketing package or something. But I, I food safety is number one to me. Yeah, I mean, we deal a lot with the, uh, for example, the poultry industry, just, you know, in harsher, colder, uh, wet environments, uh, we need to make sure that our products, our machines run properly on uh, with their products and at the end of the day, get their, the products that they're creating, whether it's, in this case, chicken, eggs, uh, things of that nature to the final customer and as made condition. So, and, and our machines do that. Yeah, I think, I think that's something that we see quite frequently. And, and when we're asked to, to bid or uh, come up with a, a solution is, you know, how, how can we help them address food safety concerns? And as Derek already mentioned, uh, a lot of that is through things like, uh, you know, being stainless steel construction, wash down, uh, you know, things uh, is, as simple as, uh, easy accessibility to operators where they can get in and do thorough cleaning. Uh, you know, we're asked more and more to operate in, in different temperature environments. Derek had mentioned cold rooms, freezer rooms, those kind of things. So our technology has to had to change over the years to address some of these uh, concerns that are directly related to food safety. And one of the thing is that I think you are more into B2B uh, space, right? So there's no B2C, right, for sure. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one of the questions that we ask, uh, you know, industry leaders is, uh, you know, since Derek, you're from the marketing side of the house, you know, one of the questions we ask is, how are consumers looking at it? You know, how are consumers looking at your product? What sort of reviews you get? What are some of the top reviews or top feedbacks that you get? And I mean, I'm sure you guys be running some sort of a metrics or some sort of a, business and you know bi you know business intelligence sort of a thing to just to see what are some of the you know top uh, feedbacks from the maybe the customers or yeah. yeah so so as you as you mentioned uh, you know we we are b2b so we don't get a lot of feedback direct from the end users they probably don't know who we are or what what we do but i can tell you 
damaged products because of the damage in transportation is like a seven billion dollar problem in North America every year. And so, you know, the customers want to get their products that aren't damaged, of course. And so when we try to improve product stability, uh, we try to maximize case packing, we try to maximize and stabilize palletizing and then contain the load better through uh, optimal use of stretch film. All those are designed to get the product from point A to point B without any damage. If you think about it, if, if there's seven point, I think it's $7.2 billion worth of damaged product annually, that's a huge amount of product that's probably going into a landfill somewhere. That, that product is typically not reusable. It's going into, so that's another step towards sustainability. So as equipment manufacturers that manufacture pieces of equipment for secondary packaging, we're always looking at ways to, to make a better package where products get to their destination as they're supposed to be. So as the consumer may not know exactly what we're doing, they do appreciate when they go to, to buy that uh, box of cereal off the shelf that the, the box isn't demolished, right? So, so that's really where we come into to that. But we really have no set of uh, criteria or studies with end users as it relates to, to our part of this industry. Good to know. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good stat. $7.2 billion damage uh, goods money. Yeah, that's, that's a lot annually. That's a lot. You yeah, know, this is what the study, what the a research paper on it as to like why this happened and how we can minimize this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, good information. So I think uh, Rodney and Derek, I think I have covered pretty much what I should have been covering from a packaging standpoint. You know, normally I have more questions, uh, you know, for someone who is into the food industry per se, you know, there, there are more things, more challenges there. Uh, anything you Think that we might have missed or anything you wanted to add that would be really good into this soundbite you know into this uh, podcast uh, first we'll we'll talk about a customer that came to us with a need to automate their case packing this particular customer was in central texas and they manufacture uh salad dressing uh glass bottles of salad dressing um they had three production lines a very busy company and they were manually packing uh, six packs and 12 packs of salad dress bottle into a cardboard box and manually sealing those boxes and manually palletizing those boxes. So we were able to sell them a solution with three automatic case packers. Now the, the products come from their filling line directly into our machine. We put them in the, the case automatically. We seal the case automatically. Once they come out of our machine, they go into a palletizer. So we automatically palletize those onto a, a wooden pallet. And as they're being palletized, we have a thing called concurrent stretch wrapping. So it wraps the pallet as the pallet's being built. So now they have what they call uh, three shepherds, which are basically one person that can go and monitor each one of these lines. So they went from around 30 employees to three employees to do this type of work. Wow. So it helped them... Uh, Many of those employees were able to be replaced in other areas of the factory where they needed help. It's not like, hey, we're just getting rid of employees. We're moving those to, to jobs that, are, that require more than somebody just mindlessly putting bottles of salad dressing into a case. So that, that's one uh, area that was as a, as a nice success story to talk about. The other one that I can talk about is in the stretch wrapping portion of our business. We do business with one of the largest water bottling companies in the country. And uh, they, uh, they actually are a very well-run company and we're doing a lot to, to reduce the plastic that they use in their product. We came to them with the idea of this technology we have that can reduce the amount of stretch film. So through a series of tests with their engineering department here at our technology lab, they were convinced that our solution would allow them to, to reduce the amount of plastic on their pallets. Again, being mindful that this company is someone that's been studying sustainability for some time, we were able to reduce the amount of plastic or stretch film that goes on their pallet by 21%. This particular large company was, was spending in excess of $11 million per year on stretch film. So a 21% reduction in stretch film is a big number. Uh, that's just 
right to the bottom line, not to mention the sustainability gains that they were able to achieve by seeing that. And as we followed up, th this particular customer took advantage of our remote monitoring system. So we can see that uh, over time, they've been able to reduce that number of stretch, that amount of stretch film to even a lower level than what we had tested. And we can see that, uh, you know, through, through that, we now can monitor and see, you know, what that sustainability impact is for them, which is very positive to their group. So those, those are just a couple of, of success stories as, as Derek mentioned. Yeah, they're worth the white paper on that. You know, it's worth the study. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, pretty good uh, achievement there. And I believe some of these machines that you have, uh, you know, build up, what were these special purpose machines only for the special task or you could pretty much use those machines, you know, for other? That's a, that's a great question. So um, our, we have two ranges of equipment. Our semi-automatic equipment are basically stock machines. Uh, they're already a pre-configured stock application and they fit a huge range of applications. The automatic uh, systems that we, we sell a lot of all come from uh, base model machines that are configurable through a bunch of options to fit a certain solution. So we may have the ba same base model machine for a water bottling company as we do for a company that makes salad dressing, but through a different set of options, we customize it for that application. So on an automatic machine, you know, you're, there's standard offerings that are customizable through a large list of options that are specific to industry and application. Well, thanks, uh, Derek Jones and Rodney Grounds. Uh, really appreciate your time on the podcast today. Um, viewers, thank you very much for tuning into the Future Foodcast. I hope that you find this content helpful. And, you know, thanks for your time. Everybody, have a good one. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcast. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry.